couple of minutes this morning to begin with remembering Ray Gingrich. Uh, along with these photos, I looked for the in uh, Cal Redekop's first uh, appendix to the book that was the first book that was published. And he noted that it was September 21, 2001, when Ray Gingrich presented a report to the group that was interested in forming some kind of a retired uh, professor's community at EMU. So this was included in Ray's report was the purpose and vision for the center, the membership organizing stru and organizational structure, and the projects that might be included. In other words, the basic vision grew out of Ray's interaction with a few others, and Ray was often the one who synthesized and took direction. And since the fall of 2002, there were forums, seminars, and colloquium uh, conducted. But he noted one of the notable and successful ACRS activities has been the monthly second Monday morning stories. The members of who brought other stories of integrating faith and life and the world of thought. So those became the published four, four books. So Ray's, Ray has been a part of this from the beginning, not only a part, but often the vision and often the ability to put into words beautifully what he what needed to be said. But Ray died this past uh, June 17, and we wanted to take a moment of silence to remember him. to introduce our speaker this morning. <coughs> I brought along uh, a copy of the book I have of, the, of John's book called Turning Enemies into Trustworthy Opponents, The Healer Messiah. Now you may notice that that is a different and unusual title, Turning Enemies into Trustworthy Opponents. John has been a research fellow at EMU's Center for Interfaith Engagement. He's lived in Canada, Germany, Belgium, France, and the United States, and served under Mennonite Central Committee in Congo in the early 70s, and in Nepal in the late 90s. He has his PhD in computer science from Duke University. He was professor of computer, computer science at JMU, teaching there for nearly 20 years. In 1992, he co-founded Rosetta Stone with his brothers-in-law, Alan and Eugene Stolzfus, and John was the VP of Research and Development there until his retirement in 2006. John's wife, Catherine, is a retired attorney, mediator, and trainer of mediators. And I think there might be a number of us here who have been part of Catherine's classes over the years. They raised four sons in Bridgewater, Virginia, and they now enjoy 13 grandchildren. Is it still 13? <laughs> they are members of Parkview Mennonite Church. Uh, I'm going to also quote just shortly from one of the chapters of John's book. I think it helps to highlight why he and Catherine took this trip to Iran. Faith is acting on the assumption that God is there. 
a presence that can be invoked, even in our spouses, siblings, neighbors, or enemies. That is the counterattack of the healer. To exercise the enemy's fear by humble concern for their personal well-being, and then invoke the good in the enemy, speak to God there, and ask God for justice. Enemies can be ambushed from within by God's spirit, who is their true self, and be healed. Or our enemies can refuse the spirit which makes them human. And I think John would also say our enemies and we can refuse the spirit which makes us human, refuse God, and nail us to a cross. That is what we are called to risk for that faith without which we will either fight or flee and make the miracle of healing impossible. John? <coughs> Thank you for that introduction, Margaret. That was really good. All right. Hang on. This is going to be a bit of a ride. We're going to Iran and the conflict between Iran and the United States. But I want to start out in Harrisonburg and the conflict between whites and blacks at an event that took place a month before Kathy and I went to Iran. At the end, I hope to tie all this together. At the, at the Harriet Tubman Cultural Center in Harrisonburg, a dozen people, blacks and whites, gathered under a hanging tree. The noose dangled in the breeze. The picture is what's on the sign in front of the tree. First, a black high school student read a poem about her daily experience with racism. Then Stan Macklin, an elderly black leader in the community, climbed painfully onto a chair and spoke briefly with the noose around his neck. Lest we forget, he said, what is burned into our history, our understanding of how our society still treats us, our place. Stan's goal is to make a safe space where the trauma of the black experience and its political and social implications can be named and discussed across color lines openly. I was nervous because he had asked me, an elderly white man, to give a prayer following his remarks. Here's what I came up with. Oh Lord, you've shown us the way, but it is so hard. Lord, you've shown what those of us with privilege should do. We ask for your courage. For Lord, you're the most privileged of all. You have eternal life. You have power. Yet you laid it all down. We were disappointed in life and angry at its injustice, and you didn't force us to behave. You gave us our freedom, our choice. So you didn't call on your legions of angels to protect you. You refused to coerce us. You gave yourself into our power. And we hung you on a tree. <laughs> Lord, you accept us even when we do you wrong. You sat down and ate with us while we were yet sinners, offenders. You ate from the same bowl as us, traitors. And we crucified you for it. If we are to display your spirit, Lord, that's the risk we have to take with each other. We have reasons to fear each other. We have reasons to want to control each other. But your spirit, Lord, would have us give up all forms of control. 
physical control, social control, economic control, give up manipulation and coercion, give ourselves into the control of our enemy, like you did with Pilate, that's giving them freedom. And risk everything on their choice, on whether they respond with your spirit too? Oh, God. This is a hard way for us, Lord. We ask for your courage. We get the message. We will try to treat each other the way you treated us. That is our goal, Lord. We often fall short. Forgive us, Lord, and help us be like you. Lord, there's another piece of this bloody story, too. Some of us are hurting, Lord. We've been traumatized. We are in pain. This tree is what the system does to us. We've seen this kind of thing before, and we'll see it again. Are we supposed to climb up on that tree? Is that all you've got to offer, Lord? We could use a little power here. But you reminded us that you wanted to heal your enemies. And part of that was confronting them and calling them to repentance. You wanted to ignite their spirits, not snuff them out. If we can really hope for that, Lord, it would be okay. We don't have to be on top. All we want is a just relationship. We want to muddle through life together, not on top, not on the damn bottom, as equals. We want to be able to confront them with what they've done and continue to do and call them to repentance while at the same time showing them that we will not coerce them. Help us to heal our enemies, Lord, while they are still oppressing us. We ask that we succeed in igniting your spirit in our enemies so that they change their ways and stop crucifying us. We ask that the cross, that tree, not be our lot. We ask that we succeed where you didn't, Lord, and so many of our brothers and sisters didn't. Our only hope is that your weakness is stronger than the power of men. Be with us, Lord. We are your hands and feet. Be with us in our suffering. Give us the strength to fight power by igniting your spirit in our enemies. This is hard, Lord. We ask for your courage. We ask for your spirit to dwell in us. Amen. Most of my life, my understanding of Christianity would not have had me craft that prayer. I wouldn't have seen to put those words together like that. What is the perspective that permits the writing of that prayer? I've written about it in a book, The Healer Messiah, on sale here at cost five bucks, or you can download it for free at thehealermessiah.com. All right. So in April, Kathy and I spent two weeks in Iran. The trip was organized by Ed Martin, past director of the Center for Interfaith Engagement here at EMU who has been in and out of Iran for 25 years, ever since he coordinated MCC relief response to an earthquake there in the early 90s. There were 17 of us. You may recognize some people here. Uh, John Kaiser, uh, author of Commander of the Faithful and the Monks of Tiberine, and his wife Pamela. Um, Morteza recognize him. That's one of our Iranian tour, tour guides. This is uh, Awatef, what's name? Awatef Masoud is a Sunni Muslim from Connecticut, born in Tunisia. Roger Clark from the state of Washington, who runs restorative justice and trauma programs in prisons there. Arvind and Ira Vora, who are Jains from New Jersey. Jains are vegans, plus there are many vegetables they can't eat. 
Nothing that comes from underground, like peanuts, carrots, beets, potatoes. Uh, Kathy and I. And the Harders from Alberta. Um, that last one I pointed to is um, Laura Brenneman, theologian and professor from Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. Uh, Morteza's wife and our own dear Amir and Shada, Amir Makrani and Shada Shakuri Randa. Here in Shader, we're here for um, two, three years uh, as, as visiting Islamic scholars under the Center for Interfaith Engagement. Uh, they have managed to finagle themselves into our tour for the first day or so in Tehran. This picture was taken at the grounds on the grounds of the Shah's palace in Tehran, now a museum, where, for instance, we walked through the garages past his collection of Rolls Royces. This is just a fraction of them. Then in stark contrast from the palace, we went to see the humble rental flat where Ayatollah Khomeini, who returned from exile in France in 1979 to a country in the throes of revolution against the Shah, lived through his subsequent effective reign over the country. He lived back behind those, uh, that glass, those glass, uh, that glass wall. Uh, behind those glass doors is a sitting room uh, where Khomeini received heads of state and through the curtains that you can see at the back there is his bedroom. To the left, it goes back to a kitchen, and that's basically it. Very humble. Uh, he'd painfully walk across this gangway. He'd painfully walk across this gangway uh, to a uh, sort of basketball gym where he entered through a door at this elevated level to an inside balcony where he could address a throng and run the business of the country. But we took this picture for another reason. This is where Amir and Shada were married, just after the revolution, by Ayatollah Khomeini himself. It was a rare honor. This, by the way, is Sayed, our other tour guide. Uh, both he, both Morteza and Sayed were fun-loving, super honest, smart, and formidably educated people. Uh, let's see if this video will run, because it just makes it live. Okay. This is lovely. Okay. Later, Kathy and I got to visit Shada and Amir at their home. How many people here know Shada or Amir? Yes, I thought so. Good. And and though we had met their son Amin, who is studying in Montreal. We had never met their daughter, Kimia, and therein lies a tale. While Amir and Shada were here in the US, their daughter, who was a student at the University of Tehran, stayed in their home in Tehran. She was always involved with theater. She loved it. But she realized one couldn't make a living at it, and at college got a degree in psychology, and having kissed the theater goodbye, is working on an advanced degree in psychology. But then she got this phone call encouraging, encouraging her to try auditioning for a certain acting gig. For the 40th anniversary of the Iranian Revolution, during the month of February next year, the government will be airing on TV a 30-day serialized depiction of the events of the revolution as seen through the eyes of some students, and there's a romantic thread, etc., etc. There were many, many women who had already tried out for the female lead. Kimia auditioned and was offered the job on the spot. Whoa, what to do? Amir and Shada fell in love during the revolutionary times. This is the story of their youth. Now, there were many secular people who were deeply involved with the revolution against the Shah, some of them communists, the, is, the Islamist government ended up purging and persecuting that secular element of the revolution, which is part of why Amir and Shada became critics of the government. This TV series 
is of course favorable to the government's position and portrays the purge of the secularists as a good thing. So, do they hold their noses and can he take the job or not? It's a huge production, now being shot on site in Tehran and other cities, and yes, Kimia is the female lead. So, we go to museums, here of traditional Iranian regional clothing and village architecture. Amir and Shaver took that photo. There's even a village that specializes in rose petals for the perfumed perfume essence. They have an annual festival where toddlers roll in rose petals, roll down a hill of rose petals so they grow up healthy. The Persian Empire once stretched from Cairo and Thessalonica in Greece to the Indus and the Himalayas. Here we are at a Jewish synagogue in Tehran. We supped at the Rasulipur's place. Parents of Mohammed Rasulipur. How many people here know Michaela or Mohammed Rasulipur or his sister? Uh, not as many as I figured. This is the <clears throat> Uh, in Tehran, there's one of those needle towers with a restaurant at the top from which you can see the city from above. Indeed, I was impressed by how the centers of the larger cities looked like cities in southern France or Italy. Same sort of traffic pattern with wide avenues lined by plain trees, glittering shops. You'd occasionally see murals painted on kiosks or walls of entire buildings commemorating Iran's hundreds of thousands of martyrs. In the eight-year war against Saddam Hussein's Iraq, soon after the revolution, very soon after the revolution, the war ended in a bitter stalemate and no change in borders. Hundreds of thousands dead. Of course, the US supported Iran, uh, uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein. Uh, the U.S. supported Saddam Hussein at the time. A class of school kids out in a park. Ed Martin's wealth of relationships created over the years was really impressive. We got to meet with well-placed people. Here are the Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Sajapur. Ed is really respected. From Tehran, we went by bus to Qom, then to Kashan, Isfahan, Yazd, Shiraz. Then took a then took a flight uh, to Mashhad in the north, and then another flight back to Tehran, and from there home. Our guide Morteza, his wife and darling son, accompanied us for much of the trip. We clearly don't have the whole group; just the door, the kid. Okay. So we get to call the religious center of Iran, with nearly 100,000 seminarians in Qom. Some of you remember Mohsen Danesh Pajou, Mohsen and his wife Katsi, and their children, who were here for several years also. Mohsen's brother Ali has been here for SPI. Would you believe Ali put off the date of his wedding four days so that Kathy and I could make it to the reception? and then invited our whole group, 17 people plus tour guides, to that reception. It's in a swank hotel, the men on one whole floor, the women on another. Kathy found the women's dress distasteful with heavy makeup and risque outfits. Most of the men at the reception are clerics, including, as it turned out, our tour guides. This is Morteza, the guy with the kid. I should explain that a cleric is a lifetime student, sort of like Hasidim. Though once they're done with their main studies, they often write books, start businesses, get into politics, engage in all forms of intellectual engagement. Recognize this guy? In clerical garb, Mosen looks formidable. Here he's just giving an answer. This is this Mosen has spent three years here in Parfum. Um, this man, oh, there's Mosen again, but this man is uh, Ali's father-in-law. I found out. I find out afterwards that the guests included a prominent member of, of about um, over, well over half of the men present are clerics. Yes, um, 
the guests include a prominent officer of the Revolutionary Guard and a member of the Guardian Council, and so on. The Guardian Council is the one that uh, has to clear all candidates for office. Uh, Mohsen's family is extraordinarily well connected to the powers that be, and Cutsy's even more so. Here is Kathy with Cutsy and Saber at Mohsen's mom's place. Mohsen and Cutsy currently live in the spacious, modern, marble, ground floor flat, one level down from where this picture was taken. Uh, this is in Mohsen's study on that ground floor, Kathy with Cutsy and Mohsen's mom. And this is Ali and his new wife. A day later, we had supper at Mansour Ibrahimi's place. Uh, Mansour was at CJP for a year. His two daughters were at EMHS. There's one of them, the other is taking the photo. And here we are in Mansour's home, applauding a fine cantor in the corner, far corner there. Is some talented cousin Mansoor had invited to chant for us and play the traditional wooden flute. Okay, back to work. Meeting with the Grand Ayatollah Alave Borujerdi and the representative slash son-in-law of the Grand, of Grand Ayatollah Al Sistani. Al Sistani is the head of many of the seminaries in Najaf, Iraq, and is described as the spiritual leader of Iraqi Shias. You should know that Najaf is traditionally more venerable than Qom as a center of Shia learning, while of late Qom is ascendant. In Iraq, the Shia speak Arabic. In Iran, they speak Farsi, Persian. Anyway, Al-Sistani, the spiritual leader of Iraqi Shias, is Iranian. Right? He's Iranian. And is a prime link in Iran's influence in Iraq. This is his son-in-law. This is uh, Murtaza, um, his son-in-law, and most of dead. Uh, um, this is his son-in-law, who is sort of his permanent ambassador in Qom. All of these dignitaries with whom we met spoke at length and convincingly of their desire for mutually spiritual, spiritually profitable relationships with those who differ with them. Uh, this is Sayyid Nawab of the Faculty of the University of Religions and Denominations. Uh, some of you know Dr. Lagenhausen. He gave a talk at the International Institute for Islamic Studies and had supper with us here with his son. Dr. Lagenhausen, son. Um, Dr. Lagenhausen was born American, um, grew up American. Uh, he gave a talk, he, he, uh, let's see, and, and, and his son at Morteza's home. And uh, oh, the food, the food, the food, the food. And now on to sheer tourism. This is a huge square in Isfahan. The King's Pavilion up there is where he'd watch the polo games down below. Uh, here we are up in that pavilion. Uh, this is the ancient residence of a single family, a wealthy commercial family. Uh, Iranians in parks. Any green area is the result of irrigation. Any green area is the result. Of irrigation. People really enjoy the <coughs> parks. Um, one way you can tell a Shia mosque from a Sunni mosque is that the preacher in a Shia mosque, as a reminder that his status is not superior to his congregants, speaks from one step below the level of everyone else. That's what the little pit is for. And oh, an ancient bridge over a major river in his farm that has been bone dry now for three years. Yes, the certification is happening. And the bazaars, and the restaurants. This is a traditional one where you recline on a dais. And the bazaars. People really enjoy their parks. You see, they're playing chess in their family. It's a family outing. Pushing things a little bit. An Armenian Christian cathedral. It's a dome. It's horrible pictures of judgment. People really enjoy their parks. A Zoroastrian temple. This, the Fravahar, is the central symbol of Zoroastrianism and is seen throughout Iran. Thanks to the American Zoroastrian. 
in, in our group. Oh, I didn't point him out. Uh, oh man, way back at the initial picture, we had one of our one of the people was a Zoroastrian, an American, in fact, the head of an association of, of the American Association of Zoroastrian Communities. Uh, he's from New Jersey. Uh, but because he was with our group of uh, Zoroastrian, um, we got to visit a lot of different Zoroastrian sites. Uh, here, some are standing in prayer in one of their ancient temples in the presence of fire, a wood fire that has reputedly been kept going since 400 and something before Christ. Uh, this is a Zoroastrian Tower of the Wind. If you climb up there, there's a circular platform. They don't do it anymore in Iran, but Zoroastrians used to lay out their dead there for the vultures. When the bones were picked clean, they were thrown into the central pit to the right there. This is at another Zoroastrian temple where this tree is reputed to be over 2,000 years old. They made special bread for us and invited us to a meal. Uh, a mosque with brilliant stained glass windows, a bathhouse where hundreds of years ago a powerful grand vizier was murdered, and the food. The tomb of Cyrus the Great. Yeah, the guy who defeated Babylon, Iraq, <coughs> and allowed the Jews in exile there to go home to Jerusalem. Cyrus the Great was Persian and Zoroastrian. Everyone in Persia back then was Zoroastrian. Iran makes Europe feel like a teenager. In Europe, it's easy to go back a thousand years. In Iran, in Iran, three thousand and more. Note, Zoroastrian isn't just not dead. Its influence in Iran is vast. When faithful Muslim Iranians want to assert their culture, their culture, as over against Arab culture, they consciously use Zoroastrian symbology and narratives. Persepolis, which is a vast spring palace complex where peoples from throughout the empire came to bring them tribute, came to bring their tribute, Greeks, Egyptians, Pakistanis, Ethiopians, bearing wine, horses, camels, slaves, silver, gold, frankincense, myrrh. The bazaars, here fragrant spices. A little demo from a martial arts school. <laughs> I want you to notice how the one handles a specific job without missing a beat. Their tombs are heavily visited. Here are the tomb of Hafez. And we also visited the tomb of Saadi, who is even more ancient, a century and a half before Chaucer. And he's still widely read, easily read. And who was a great influence on Hafez. Morteza translated a couplet of Saadi. Remember this. Oh, my friend, appreciate the sunrise breeze which, like the breath of Jesus, revives your dead spirit. For that breath is from him. Capital H. Perhaps the major difference between Sunni and Shia is that the Shia have shrines revering certain sainted figures from the past. This one honoring the sister of one of the 12 Shia Imams. She was killed at this place. A shrine isn't just a huge public square with a couple of mosques. It is an interlocking complex of huge squares with many mosques. The tiles here are tiny mirrors that make a surreal environment. Tiny tiles. Deep in the center of the complex will be the tomb 
in a large room divided in half. Um, Women on the far side, men on this side of this <coughs> low wall. Mm. Um, inside the grill where Sayed is praying is the sarcophagus. So from Shiraz in the south, we board a plane from Mashhad in the north. The airport is modern. Several commercial airlines offer heavily booked flights throughout the country. I've never stayed in five-star hotels before in my life. This is in Mashhad. There are festivals in Iran where people just start feeding passers-by, offering tea and baked goods, just the bag of it. Another shrine, this one of Imam Reza. The brother of the woman who shrined with the before. This shrine is reputedly the first or second largest in the world. They have uh, carts of rugs that people just grab and roll out to picnic on. It's a continual happening. You go through those portals that you saw, big portals, to more huge squares and mosques that just go on and on. Football stadium-sized LCD panels give songs and sermons. Okay, back to work. This is the last day of the trip. We're at huge Ferdowsi University in Mashhad. Roger Cluck is off giving a training on restorative justice in prisons. The rest of us are in another seminar. First, some of their scholars speak, and then three of our people. Laura Brenneman on the role of women, Morteza is translating. John Kaiser on his book about El Qader. And me, summarizing a paper I had submitted to a conference in Mashhad the year before, but was unable to attend. So, some of these people had already read my paper. It was subsequently published in JMU's fledgling International Journal on Responsibility. You can freely download it from there. Search for International Journal Responsibility, JMU, you'll get it. I want to end my presentation this morning by giving you that talk, that same talk. It should take about 12 minutes and we're done. I hope it will tie things together for you. So here goes. In the name of God, the just, the merciful. Saadi wrote, Oh my friend, appreciate the sunrise breeze, which like the breath of Jesus, revives your dead spirit, for that breath is from him. Suppose we are under attack by someone who thinks we have harmed them. We have harmed humanity. They think we are evil and the world would be better off without us. What should we do? My answer is that we should court that enemy to treat us fairly. I'm abusing the word courtship to mean the following. Hello? Ah. Non-control. We pledge to neither coerce them, nor deceive them, nor evade them. We assure them that they are free, that we will not attempt to control them or manipulate them in any way. Respect. Second point. We pledge our respect for their safety, identity, history, dignity, and honor. Hospitality. We extend hospitality. We invite them to eat with us. Non-compliance. We tell them we do not want to be dominated either. We do not comply with any attempt to coerce us. Asking them to excuse us, we deliberately cross any lines of control that the enemy has laid down. Given that we will not use either coercion or evasion, we risk imprisonment or death, but we do not comply. Sharing. 
If there are needs of our enemy that can be met without compromising our own identity or honor, we share resources to fill those needs. We boldly ask our enemy to share what they have that we need and keep asking until we are satisfied. Reciprocity. We ask them to treat us the same way we're treating them. That's courtship. The goal is not to win and have our enemy lose. Our only salvation is our enemy's salvation. The goal is not friendship. We may never be friends. We may never like each other. The goal is to establish a confrontational but trustworthy relationship where nobody is in control. We want them to consider us to be trustworthy opponents in a fair relationship. Our goal is justice. We do not comply with coercion because no amount of compliance will make them stop coercing us. We do not bribe them in any way because we are not appealing to their base instincts. Rather, we are appealing to their instinct for fairness. My two-year-old grandson, Jude, doesn't talk much yet. But if his older brother doesn't share his toys fairly, equally, little Jude is in sorrow. Jude weeps. He feels it instinctively. Fairness is justice, and we humans have an inborn instinct for it. Courtship is an attempt to inspire, ignite the spirit of fairness in our enemy. Oh, my enemy, appreciate the morning breeze. Courtship is a high-risk strategy. It clearly is not always successful. But coercion is very often not successful. In fact, coercion is far less than 50% successful since one of the parties to a fight always loses, and often it becomes a bloody cycle of violence that lasts for generations. Everybody loses. So courtship doesn't have to do very well to do much better than coercion or evasion, fight or flight. My argument is purely pragmatic, not moral. My paper gives criteria for deciding when it is appropriate to use coercion and when courtship is better. People have the right to violent self-defense. Sometimes it's just not very smart. People have the right to flee. Sometimes it's not the wisest thing to do. My paper examines some nightmare scenarios, rape, the Holocaust, the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s, to analyze when we should use coercion or evasion and when we should use courtship. So, graphically, injustice is a situation where each side sees the other as subhuman monsters. Each side sees the other as subhuman monsters. And try to control the other side by violence. Justice is a situation where both sides see the other as normal, fallible humans. And though there is often confrontation, neither side is trying to control the other. Courtship starts with an unjust situation where our enemy, say the right-hand side, sees us as monsters. Right? We are seen as monsters. We're over on this side. And they are oppressing or controlling us via violence. But we see them as humans and respond to their violence with respect, hospitality, non-compliance, and non-coercion. Here we go. 
Imagine you're a shopkeeper. The little bell on your shop door rings. A young man steps inside. He looks around and says, nice little shop. Be a shame if something happened to it. There's been a lot of troubles recently. There are a lot of bad people out there. I belong to a gang, a mafia. We have weapons. We can protect you. We can keep your shop safe. All we need from you is a small monthly contribution. A mafia offers you protection in exchange for a tax. That is the root justification of government, to offer security from the bad guys. Governments are, at their root, mafia. Now, some governments are much better than others. Some countries' governments are very domesticated mafia. These are countries with a developed rule of law. And at least on paper, everyone is under the law, and violence can only be used in lawful ways. These countries also, culturally, sustain a wide open public debate. It's called freedom of expression, freedom of the press, so that information cannot be wholly manipulated by their mafia. So the abuses that mafia are naturally prone to are minimized. But in my view, all governments are but domesticated mafia that can easily fall back into the primitive logic of mafia. Mafia need enemies, bad guys, or there is no justification for their taxes. They draw lines in the sand and say, on one side of this line is our turf. One side is Iran. One side is Iraq. One side is United States. One side is Mexico. Beyond that line are people that you need to be protected from. Mafia say, humans on the other side of that line are different from humans on this side. They are less trustworthy. Sometimes it's okay to kill them, because otherwise they would take over our turf. They create Iran. They create the United States, not just as different governments, but as different classes of humanity. They call the other side the axis of evil, or the great Satan. The U.S. and Iran have a problem. Our problem is not that we have different religions. Our problem is that we have the same religion. Our common religion is this. We have faith in coercion as the most effective response to coercion. We believe in violence as the ultimate guarantor of justice. We fear that situations will only be fair as long as we are in control. We trust in weapons to give us security. We assume that only superior force will guarantee us a fair deal. This religion, this false god, that most Americans and Iranians share, causes them to condone their governments for what they do. To this false god, we give our money and sacrifice our children and call them heroes, martyrs. We must repent, turn away from that false god. Our security should be built on courtship, not on coercion. God courts us even when we are offensive to God. Therefore, we should court each other. It is my job to call Americans to repentance. It is your job to call Iranians. What should we do, we in this room, we who submit to God the just, the merciful, and no one else? We must struggle against the false god, but our jihad is by courtship, by igniting the spirit of fairness in our political enemies within our own countries. Our goal is to heal our enemy of their fears, and their reliance on coercion, to have them turn from their violence and to join us as trustworthy opponents. If that can be done within a nation, it can also be done 
between nations. is, uh, she's, she's poking me on, I said uh, that it was, this is strictly a pragmatic argument, uh, and she's pushing me on that and saying, hey, wait a minute, this, this doesn't smell like just a pragmatic argument. Um, and on, on two levels. One is, I do want to make my case pragmatically, right? But of course, in terms of where does this come from personally? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> ah. That's the and my Anabaptist heritage. And I certainly, certainly in the book, The Healer Messiah, that is front and center. There I speak to Christians. In the article, I, the paper I was presenting, and in the, it was published then in JMU's a journal for, um, uh, a journal on, International Journal on Responsibility. Uh, there I try to make a purely secular, purely pragmatic argument. Thank you. What was the response to your paper at the gathering? Uh, the question is, what was my response? What was the response there to my, to my paper? A lot of people expressed a lot of appreciation. Um, several people came up and asked for links to the publication. And I, since then, my email correspondents sent them links to the uh, uh, International Journal of Responsibility that you know, where they can get the article. Uh, and, so was it a polite appreciation or was it a critique? You know, there was no critique. And I really, really wish. I have yet to have some pushback. I'd love it if one of you guys, people, would push back. Because I think that there's, some, uh, that for many people, uh, the case is far from proven that we should use something like courtship to replace our reliance on arms. 